Ugly Splendid Abodes, the official podcast of Toronto Thelema, exploring, if you will, practical philosophy, from science and the workings of the mind to spirituality, esotericism, and magic. down, dipping my wings, I came into the darkly splendid abodes. In his essay, Energized Enthusiasm, Crowley posits how the divine creative energy can be tapped into as a source of power which he calls genius. We'll delve into this elementary treatise on his theory and practice of sex magic as we kick off season four of the darkly splendid abodes. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will. Welcome to season four. Hello. And uh, yeah, this is a season four of our Deep Dip series, uh, looking into uh, some of the different papers, books, and um, maybe indirect writings uh, related to Thelema. And not that it matters, because uh, none of the, uh, most of this stuff, you know, none of it's news, uh, but we're now recording more or less right on top of our release schedule. Yeah, so, pretty close to it. Yeah, uh, um, there'll be more. Uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we're closer in time to you, dear listener. So that's uh, <laughs> nice for us, maybe. At least if you're listening to it uh, on first release. Oh God! After that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the nuance, the nuance, the nuance of of broadcast. It's, it's endlessly fascinating. To Michael's going to lose discuss again. Discuss and <laughs> rediscuss the nuance of broadcast. So today we are going to look at. We we're just discussing the uh, the catalog number of this Lieber. Yeah, there. I have. I have. Uh, uh, well, let's give the correct one, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, 811, which uh, a little bulb goes off in my head that makes me want to, I don't know if I want to say laugh, but just sort of reference something, but it's like an obscure reference that nobody will get because 811, there was a, <laughs> there was a morning talk show host, kind of like one of those Howard Stern ripoffs back in the early 2000s that uh, every morning they would, uh, when it came to 811, they would specifically say 811 because it sounds like anal lovin'. Oh, my God. And that was their bit. That's way fun. I mean, not that it's hilarious, not that it's, you know, a material. But uh, <laughs> I, thought, I, thought you, I don't know why I went there, but I thought, like, yeah, I always laugh whenever I hear the number 811 because that's the time my high school burned down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't know why that was the joke. It's been a while since we've been on mic together yeah <laughs> yeah and welcome back how did your how do you feel about having wrapped up all your uh distracting school nonsense yeah i have a final tomorrow and a final on thursday and then uh um and then i'm going to be a, a regulated health professional and i've been Ooh. thinking a lot about uh, uh health professions this week because uh, the internet just figured out that chiropractic medicine is a branch of occultism and everyone is freaking out. <laughs> have you uh, have you seen these YouTube videos or am I just in that bubble now? No, that's all your your algorithm. Yeah, uh, it, the founder of chiropractic medicine, it, apparently it came to him in a dream. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, well. uh, um, and they used extremely coercive tactics to become a regulated health professional in the United States. And, uh, and uh, I, I don't know what the practice of chiropractic medicine is like now, but for a while, it, the idea was that you could do internal medicine or even psychology by doing spinal adjustments. You know, there were these, if you had a subluxated vertebrae, that was the cause of your endometriosis. And, uh. they, you know, they were convinced that uh, that spinal manipulations would do all these miraculous things. Yeah, what is it about human psyches that, uh, human psychology that causes us to think, you know, this goes back to Frazier, J.G. Frazier, and the idea of like uh, correspondences to things, spooky correspondences to things, but the idea that, oh, 
this seems to work really well doing things in this area. Yeah. And somehow that's going to solve all of our problems. <laughs> I, it, you know, there's, I, I think that the, the, the foundation of it is, is that the practice of medicine is not really a science. We talk about doing work that's evidence-based, which means we're informed by people who do experimental science. But um, really, we work in a tradition of these techniques are applied to these um, these conditions, and, and uh, you're a mechanic, right? You're a very highly skilled, <laughs> highly paid mechanic, and a, a, a patient comes in with a particular misalignment of some, not vertebra, but some, some problem, and you just uh, you apply the techniques as informed by science hopefully but, sounds like hokum to me. uh but yeah it's it's it is kind of a kind of an occult um uh, hmm. pra- practice and uh well you uh, know that's it's funny because that brings to mind like something that i was going to bring up with this paper at some point we'll get to it but uh um the fact that there's that epoch bias i'm just going to coin a term there I'm assuming, I'm sure somebody else has, or some AI has come up with that before, but the idea that like, oh, okay, now we can look back at these different points in time and, and say that, uh, uh, you know, X period of time, medical professionals were actually not much better than witch doctors or something <laughs> like that. And it's like, yeah, they're going to think that about us. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to be that far off. Many things that are now, um, if, uh, an English teacher I had for once t- called that the uh, the back in the day when people were stupid argument. Yeah, so I encountered that a lot <laughs> from students who were analyzing the history of, you know, uh, yeah, and that kind of histories. shit happened all the time back now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, I and I, and a lot of the things that are like really cool occult techniques now. Um, uh, and and firmly implanted in in the realm of occultism, I'm thinking of stuff like uh, like radionics or the the Scientology e meter or you know let's say uh, although this may be a little bit more uh, controversial but like acupuncture and mm. and they all came from people who were trying to do something in medicine and didn't quite. <laughs> didn't quite get there. Reiki's an exception because uh, the 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 guy was supposedly, although that's not even true. There's a, so much folklore around Reiki. There's mm. one book I read said the guy was specifically looking for the healing arts that were used by Jesus, which is not true. <laughs> 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 but uh, anyway, yeah. So th- we were just talking about the best the best way to remain anonymous as a <laughs> uh, as a as a regulated health professional and a. Uh, <laughs> And so we're not a, out and to an which we've landed right here in the middle of this conversation. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, especially massage therapy, which is 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 what I do. Um, I you know it's a two year, two or three year college diploma. We're definitely not scientists. Do you, you get know? to put letters beside your name? Uh, RMT, oh, yeah, which okay. is not. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's silly, but um, the techniques, many of which work but have not been you know rigorously studied in laboratory conditions it's about you know even though we study anatomy and physiology and stuff it's about it's about applying techniques that are in uh it, it have come come down as part of the tradition for gotcha so it's a tradition years. it works but you know yeah we just do it because it works and there is research about it and we're supposed to uh, strive to be evidence-based but because massage therapists aren't scientists we don't there is some there, there isn't enough research that happens so we mm-hmm. just li- we live in kind of an occult world and people will get upset with me for saying that but part of the reason i was thinking about it too is in this paper that we're going to read there's a um a section where crowley is thinking about um uh, sort of a eugenics program and what that would look like mm-hmm. uh, you know uh, he says um, we need some rigorous physical tests to uh, simulate the natural world, because I guess his feeling is we no longer live in the natural world. Uh, you know, virtually everyone survives to breeding age, and anyone who wants one can find a, a breeding partner. So um, evolution has just stopped. And rather than, you know, artificially selecting for traits that we prefer the way a lot of eugenicists 
might suggest in ways that rapidly become problematic. Uh, Crowley's just saying, yeah, we need we need rigorous physical tests, rigorous and diverse physical tests, so that the best physical specimens survive. And uh, I don't know whether he's saying die metaphorically or literally. But, yeah, you know. I, I think in this case, it seems like he's also talking about this as almost like an elite, uh, not not for everybody, but for this specific sort of clergy that he's talking about. And that once, he has in mind. yeah, and then once uh, once you pass the physical test, then there's the tests of initiation, which uh, you know filter for people who can uh, best express um, best express genius. And uh, it's, it's, it's related to something in, in Nietzsche where he talks about how uh, healthy people can't possibly administer to the sick because mm. sick people are contagious. And so healthy people need good air. And what he means is not literally sick people, but people who are more, you know, morally corrupt and can't express genius. You need to kind of... There, there needs to be an elite class that's removed from... Uh, mm. that, that's removed from... The, the duty of ministering to uh, to the sick. Anyway, it's uh, the, the the sort of perversity of that <laughs> in a way uh, made me. I was thinking about you know it's you can understand the scientific le- landscape, right? I mean, it's not just uh, um, social Darwinism, but like the you know, it's, oh well, if if species develop and advance and refine themselves by natural selection and we live in a world without natural selection then that seems like a problem and Crowley's proposing solutions and I think that this is one of the reasons to distance pure science from the practice of medicine yeah (laughs) (laughs) because this seems justified in the realm of pure science but reprehensible Mm -hmm. in terms of dealing with actual people with actual conditions yeah so and i think there's a naivety to well i mean this this ties into what i was saying about the idea that uh there's that epoch thinking where it's Mm -hmm. like oh you can see that this is crowley uh that was a big part of his thinking in this epoch between world wars i mean this was before the first world war so i guess it's post nietzschean post-Darwinism uh, kind of, or mid-Nietzschean, mid-Darwinism, I guess is more <laughs> accurate. Uh, it's very much steeped in that zeitgeist. And uh, yeah, I don't know if, uh, now that I'm thinking about it, uh, maybe Magic Without Tears would give us some sense if he still carried those ideas forward during or after World War II, mm. or if the, the atrocities of the Nazis and their approach uh, caused him to rethink that whole sort of program to some extent. Yeah. Um, uh, Crowley's relationship with Nazism is something we've kind of glanced over before, which is not a season four topic that I want to hit, but maybe a season five or six topic because Mm -hmm. he sort of uh, begins the war with some German sympathies and then ends the war uh, I, I I hope we'll discover firmly on the British <laughs> side, and there are things in uh, Magic Without Tears where he's critical of Hitler in a way that's sort of like, you know, uh, well this is this is a good idea, this is a bad manifestation of a good idea, yeah, you yeah. know, these are these ideas are helpful, these ideas are not, and and. You know, perhaps we can say this is why, like, he was maybe trying to get in touch with the Fuhrer so that he could Mm. offer some guidance, but uh, which seems profoundly misguided (laughs) uh, uh, from our perspective in the 21st century. With the the benefit of hindsight, yeah. yeah. But, uh, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, you look at any any ideas will uh, inevitably devolve uh, as they get dispersed out to the public. And they'll manifest in very crude and uh, almost parodied form. Uh, This is one of the things that I've been watching with. You have somebody who makes intelligent statements about how things should be. I mean, I've watched this happen with, for instance, Keith 418 is in the Thelemic sphere. Uh, He'll say things that are intelligent and grounded and make sense. And then you can watch it just bounce around uh, like, you know, from person to person on the internet and just the way that these people parrot things, it just ends up being a gross parody and it doesn't carry the actual sense or spirit of the thing 
across. Yeah. It just becomes, you know, the, the same thing that feeds into mob kind of ideas, you know. Yeah, I mean, there's there's no one with whom that guy can have a meaningful conversation. I mean, David Jones, maybe, and uh, a couple of others. Uh, I, and I remember I was uh, moderating a forum that he was posting on regularly, and I remember him lamenting this, that, like, present company included, like, even, even uh, not even myself is like, oh, you know, like, <laughs> I'm so smart. But, uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't uh, uh, exclude myself from this criticism. There's just no one... Uh, available to have the kinds of conversations that he wanted to have, which to me seemed like a, a not a great complaint. But I guess if you're a person who sometimes gets lonely, I don't, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't feel the need to talk to people about stuff. But. <laughs> I think in this case, though, with this paper, this is like we're going to be confronted with a few things that are going to be uh, the ugly aspects of Crowley that we need to confront and we've wanted to confront, but it's just trying to do it in the right context. Yeah. I, and I've been thinking about getting distracted by that mm. and because there's a, there's a, a core thread that is usefully pulled. And um, uh, if we spend 25 minutes talking about Crowley's feminism, we may, we may not get to the, the real material mm -hmm. and, uh, and, um, although we can, we sh you're right. We shouldn't omit those quotations. How how did you like the paper this week? Uh, it's interesting because it's it is the type of thing where um, having read this in the past, that's one of the things that came to mind. It it really shone a light on the the fact that when I'll read through a paper like this. It's like there's an introversion to the act of reading that causes me to almost have, you know, it's like you, you ch pick and choose what you're putting your focus on. So some of those things that I just chose to not pay attention to, mm -hmm. and then other things that I did choose to pay attention to and that sort of thing. So in reading this for this, where I'm actually analyzing it and trying to uh, assess it in terms of a conversation, it does sort of bring out those other things that maybe I just didn't you know I wouldn't have thought of were in this paper until right. having to address them what's the uh, what's the subject what are we talking about this week because we've uh, we've we've said a lot of things on the periphery of it but yeah. what's the topic so we're on energized enthusiasm which yeah. is one of those terms that uh, you know it's it's like scientific illuminism I think it's a brilliant term but it sounds crazy <laughs> it sounds like a weird you know cult uh, like Scientology or something like that uh, I this is a paper about using sex magic techniques to contact genius and genius uh in occultism doesn't mean i've said before that guy's a genius <laughs> it means like your whole what we think of in Thelema as being like your holy guardian angel except in this paper it also means well that guy's a genius <laughs> because when you um uh because when you're in relationship with spirit the pure creative energy can come through so it's a paper about how what sex magic is, how it works, and 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 how by using it to contact genius, you can tran you can tr uh, channel a sort of pure form of inspiration. Uh, what we now kind of naively call a flow state or something, where you just uh, where where you're just creating without worrying about creating or or, mm -hmm. or giving. Uh, second thought to the next line. Crowley's uh, uh, examples in here are all about poetry because that's his um, that's his uh, that's, his, that's yeah. his area of of study in this in this period. Later, he'll talk about painting and stuff. Um, but uh, one might imagine uh, that you could do any sort of creative work with these uh, these techniques. Um, and the other thing is that the papers sort of operating in a, in a tradition saying that he or he believes that there is a relationship between genius and sex drive. And so he's trying to figure that out. Uh, the first couple of sections, sections two and three of this paper, 
are devoted to trying to understand what the relationship between genius and sex drive is in a scientific way and failing to do that mm-hmm. because he he it, it everything is a counterexample to everything else he's you know sometimes i i have a lot of sex and i feel great but i can't produce anything sometimes i have no sex and then i have for, for months and then I have one great orgiastic experience and I, I write for two days and sometimes, you know, I'm just in a positive relationship with someone I care about and that becomes productive. So he doesn't, he, the thing that's clear is that, that celibacy is not the answer because in the tradition often, uh, ch- he says chastity means celibacy and by preserving uh, sexual fluid, you can then consecrate it to genius and just never ever have a have an orgasm, and and that will allow the spirit to channel through. He says that's not exactly how it works. There's this re- there's this more complex relationship between chastity, abstinence, and and sex that's uh, that that I that I can't quite put my finger on. It, even though I'm a textbook case, like I have so much of this genius juice mm-hmm. that uh, uh, I'll sell that, it that later if, on in the that, 30s. <laughs> <laughs> that, if, that if anyone uh, could describe scientifically describe the relationship, I would be the one. Uh, except that I, you know, it, it seems inscrutable. You know, mm-hmm. every experiment produces different results. Another thing that got me thinking about this science medicine occultism sort of triangle yeah, so it all comes that together yeah. conversation with does that track is that what you think the paper's about no that's absolutely on on the nose it, it's like that's the difficulty of the first the opening paragraphs is that it's exactly as i say except slightly looser than you want to make it say because <laughs> it's it's yeah it's not tracking in terms of his uh um, making any clear connections and that sort of thing. Cause it's like, well, sometimes I'll have real huge output mm-hmm. and these are the circumstances. And then other times I'll have huge op- output and these are the circumstances, but it's not clear that he's trying to make a statement about what the circumstances should be or anything like that. But I feel like, yeah, once you've read through the whole paper, if you go back and revisit that portion, maybe the the thesis of the rest of the paper is is kind of get alluding to the uh, elements that he thinks are necessary. And particularly, I mean, some of the elements include not having uh, completely gross animal stimulation, but instead making it sacred. Right. There's a, um, a a sort of Kantian idea about aesthetics, about art appreciation. I can't remember what it's called. He has some fancy word for it, you know, some fancy Kantian word. Uh, but um, the idea is that in the same way you look at a beautiful painting of an apple and you appreciate it for the uh, for its aesthetic qualities, but you don't want to eat it. <laughs> um, uh, you need to look at an, an, an erotic nude or a, a, a statue of a, of, a, of a beautiful woman or, uh, or even a love scene in a movie, to use an anachronistic example. And uh, it's important that it's beautiful. It has mm-hmm. to be... It has to be beautiful because, the, you know, we're talking about aesthetic appreciation. Um, but in the same way you don't want to eat the apple you also can't want to fuck the statue the, the <laughs> i like his, his his metaphor is uh get it, you don't want to be getting drunk on the communion wine sure yeah right? it's uh that you um you do have to complete the sex act in crowley not in kant in crowley you do have to complete the sex act i don't think kant had any sex <laughs> <laughs> but you have to do it in 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 a way that pr- preserves uh mental chastity you know you're you're focused on on the divine and he'll have recommendations about how to structure rituals uh, 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 you know including or excluding beautiful dancers based on the depth of the training of the people uh, of the participants in the ritual if if they can uh, um, be if it can stay know, spontaneous. I don't know how to what words to use. I don't know whether to say to become erotically excited without being sexually excited. Like I don't know whether that makes <laughs> sense. But to yeah. be, be be erotically excited in a spiritual way without being lustful is maybe yeah. the way he says the it. The key to it is that he he's trying to get across the idea of spiritualizing 
this sexual um, component so that it's divine and not made just bestial. Uh, he uses he references uh, Protestantism as being this uh, because of its restrictive nature and and making it shameful to have uh, to engage with the sex act or even talk about it in a civil manner or anything like that. It reduces it to something bestial and uh, they churn into just leering and uh, they have to joke things off and that sort of thing, which is just makes me think of my experiences, you know, back in the day when we were putting on Gnostic masses. And this is why I had such frustration trying to do this in a sacred kind of space when we started to allow people coming in publicly and that sort of thing. It's like people don't know how to conduct themselves. People pretend they are, you know, <laughs> liberated people who can deal with sexuality and that sort of thing, but something – and the Gnostic Mass is not – like some kind of orgy or anything like that. It, it's not that erotic. It's not right? that like, big of a deal. A, the, you know, uh, there's an aesthetic quality that needs to be appreciated. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it, I mean, uh, I think uh, the note uh, Crowley has is in savage countries uh, <laughs> like England. Yeah. Um, that's not only a joke. I thought it was a joke when I read it originally, yeah, and then I, I learned it's not. Yeah, <laughs> it's no, really there's not. a the the um, here. I don't I don't know if India actually is the way he describes. I kind of suspect it's not. But in this paper, he says two or three things which seem like really prejudice <laughs> about <laughs> about how Indians approach sex. Mm -hmm. uh, he's sort of holding that up as as an as an ideal, right? As that this would be better. Um, to have a, a less formalized, less anxious approach, you know, to, to sexual training and stuff like this. Yeah, and I th one of the things that that really, like, just this, this, uh, this idea that he's trying to get across about the divinity of it, he's really putting a lot of emphasis on that. And um, I, I think that's worth emphasizing for us because I feel like the perception tends to be when people talk about Crowley and uh, people think about Crowley and his, you know, how sex would play into the whole scheme of Thelema and whatnot um, and the OTO or whatever, you know, these types of things, people tend to have like uh, an eyes wide shut kind of scenario in their head or they – even worse, they'll have like uh, something very um, – just very carnal, and it's almost like an excuse mm -hmm. for carnality. Uh, and no, this is like everywhere he talks about this subject, he's trying to lay emphasis on the fact that no, this is this is a uh, seeing it as um, analogous to the divine exaltation. Uh, of, I guess you could say, like things like union with God, and this should be done for the love of God. So he's putting a lot of emphasis on that. Crowley does two things really, really well as a writer. He writes terrific um, instruction papers, brass tacks, bare bones, like step by step, this is how you achieve mm -hmm. spiritual you know, ends. Like this is how you meditate. This is how you, you know, do a pentagram ritual. Spectacular. Very good at that. And the other thing he does really, really well is write early 20th century pulp fiction. <laughs> uh, um, he can write, he can write a great HP Lovecraft story. He can write a great, uh, Sherlock Holmes story. You know, he knows how to do this. And, uh, I think I realized yesterday I was reading it again. This is a Lovecraft story. Mm. You know, he starts out, um, kind of trying to do one of his instruction papers and you're not sure why he, like he's bringing in these personal experiences or getting distracted by these kind of more sinister motifs like the eugenics program or, you know, he says, well, we need to resurrect the worship of Aphrodite, Dionysus, and uh, um, uh, the other one, Apollo. Apollo. Yeah, um, and, which comes uh, up in uh, Liber HHH as well. Uh, and then uh, in the middle of the story, he's kidnapped. And he keeps writing and he ends up in this like weird mansion in the countryside doing this ritual that I, I suspect n he, he never actually, this never occurred. Well, that what you're saying didn't occur to C.F. Russell. Apparently he, uh, when he met Ahad in Detroit, I think that's when it was, mm -hmm. he uh, was asking Ahad, uh, like, so 
do you have you ever been to one of those things that he wrote about right, in right, energized right. enthusiasm and Akkad was like uh, I think it was metaphorical I, yeah. and <laughs> I, I was, was like I don't know I'm schizophrenic yeah <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I am half the time I was kind of thinking maybe Probably. that's one of the you know C.F. Russell seems to be one of those personality types where he could have uh, you know that might have been the seed of his resentment towards Akkad just thinking like oh you're a sham or something like right, that you right, know because right. you're not living up to my my preconception of what what I'm trying to get into here. Um, but uh, he, he Crowley's starting out by trying to describe, not starting out, but the, the, the after getting through the whole, the, the, the sort of preparatory remarks, he starts trying to talk about how to build out a ritual for to, for this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and, you know, talking about mantra work and maybe a little bit of gentle dancing swaying from side by side. Everyone's focused on a flame. Uh, the actual object of meditation shouldn't be that sexy because, you know, what if we're dealing with beginner types who would have a tendency to get carried away with the, um, with the, the, the lust end rather than being able to keep it sacred. So let's just have a dancing flame instead of a dancing Mm-hmm. We want to achieve a sort of trance. We don't want to be, yeah. Uh, and then, and then, uh, as he's trying to describe this, he someone takes him to a full-on sex magic. <laughs> uh, you know, he gets kidnapped out of the middle of that idea, developing his ritual, and right into the shit. And uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's great. And uh, maybe you can imagine that this is a real thing that happened to him because there's all sorts of crazy stuff going on. And, you know, he lives in a period where there really are spiritualist cults and masonry is, you know, doing great and... Uh, the, all sorts of Rosicrucians and different type, you know, it's a, it's a very productive time for mm-hmm. cult people. So maybe it happens or maybe it's just his imagination of what, uh, uh, you know, a secret gathering of high ranking OTO people might look yeah, like. Yeah, I, I feel like going off the cuff and just, hey, want to come along with it and not having been there for that purpose and them not having, you know, with these kinds of meetings, not this specific kind of meeting, but, you know, like Masonic style meetings and that sort of thing. There's a lot of uh, prep preparation for it and planning and, and that. You're not just going to off the cuff be like, oh, I'm going to show up along with my buddy here and, you know, but it's got, fine. But it's got such a great, like, weird fiction hook at yeah. the end, right? He says, I asked him, if that was a low mass, might I not be permitted to witness a high mass? Perhaps, he answered with a curious smile, if all they tell of you is true. It's a couple more paragraphs, but that really should have been the end of the story. <laughs> <laughs> I like the fact that, like, it's, uh, like, I'd never really paid attention but before, but the, because uh, each of the sections of this are numbered with Roman numerals, and that section for that whole mass that takes place is uh, numbered 15, mm-hmm. which, of course, is the tarot trump, uh, the devil, which is, of course, also the number of the Gnostic mass, yeah. and which he hadn't written at this point, but would, and uh, would give the number 15. So, it, I, th- I think it's pretty clearly intentional. Oh, so this is pre... Pre Pre-Gnostic. Actually, yeah, we could talk about the date of this, too, because it was originally published in the uh, the Equinox, Volume 1, Number 9. Number 9. Okay. Number (laughs) 9. Sorry. (laughs) Alan Calter, back in the room. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so, uh, and that was in 1913. Okay. Um, so that would have been spring equinox 1913, unless I'm very much mistaken. But uh, uh, yeah, so – and which was kind of interesting timing as well because that was about the time that he was talking about um, Theodore Royce having confronted him at his flat and uh, claiming that he had published the uh, secrets of the OTO. Mm-hmm. And uh, then he pulled a, a copy of the Book of Lies off the shelf and pointed to – flipped to a particular page and pointed to it. And, uh, yeah, just thinking about that now, as we're looking at this paper, it made me think, well, the timing lines up. Maybe he was, you know, maybe it was actually energized enthusiasm, considering it's it's, uh, it's got so much uh, in it that seems to pertain to um, sex magic and everything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But uh, it's funny because in the table of contents as well, there's that typical uh, Crowley sense of humor. Uh, beside each of the pieces that are included in that number of the equinox, there's a uh, asterisk that leads you down to the bottom of the page and says, not accepted by the English review. And, you know, there's like other stuff like uh, some paper uh, on on mountain climbing and 
not accepted by or even submitted to the Alpine Club. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's look I have, uh, at the second section of this, because the first section is a, is a dedication and an, and an invocation. Yeah, we have a little Masonic nod again there, too, with the uh, basically IAO, the Supreme One of the Gnostics, the true God, is the Lord of this work. Let us therefore invoke him by that name, which is the companions of the Royal Ark blaspheme to aid us in the essay to declare the means which he has bestowed upon us. You wanted to skip it. And then I just read it all. Perfect. Yeah. And he, well, I was going to skip it because I don't have anything particular to say about it, except that it's cool to have this dedicated in the name of a blasphemy. We were yeah. talking to some, uh, uh, some initiates last night, mm. uh, and we were uh, um, sort of discussing this idea of of having a confrontation with God. You know, daring mm. uh, daring various spirits to uh, and, and challenging, uh, and and the way in which speculating by the way in which that can be helpful for various magic rituals. And I brought this up as being a, a cool thing where the invocation is, uh, it's not a direct challenge, but it includes in the invocation the idea of a challenge because the companions of the Royal Ark blaspheme this yeah. whatever god they're trying to name. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether or not you, you, I, I, you were a companion of the Royal Ark. <laughs> no, the Royal but Ark, that but would be a third degree. Yeah, third degree Mason. Of, but uh, it might be – it's one of these things that's easy to pass by that little mm-hmm. first section without too much thought. But maybe there's – maybe it's something to keep in the back of our heads because IAO or Yao as the god over this work. And, you know, also keeping in mind that uh, correspondence of the final mass at the end of this where it's uh, number 15, which is the devil card mm-hmm. and uh, – there's, you know, the devil card obviously has immediate superficial connotations, but there's also deeper uh, doctrines to it, especially sexual doctrines and that sort of thing. So. That more or less solidifies my hot take that that ritual didn't happen. I think it's a, I think uh, what I'm thinking now is that what probably happened is that he was writing this, you know, this this kind of love, you know, Algernon story, Algernon Blackwood story, mm-hmm. and uh, as a, as an ad for his for his cult, like maybe trying to get people into the AA, and has this thing where he says, "Oh, a friend of a friend of mine will give you the address yeah. if you want to inquire," <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, and that the Gnostic Mass fulfills the promise made by this piece if it mm-hmm. hadn't in fact been written yet. So that yeah. would be. And it may very well. I can't remember exactly when the Gnostic Mass was written, but uh, it may have been written at this time and he may have just still had it under wraps and that's what this is his sales pitch for it so the divine consciousness which is reflected and refracted in the works of genius feeds upon a certain secretion as i believe this secretion is analogous to semen but not identical with it there are but few men and fewer women whose being invariably adrogyne who possess it in any time in any quantity Let's get the the casual sexism <laughs> out of the way. Uh, uh, few men and fewer women who possess genius. The women who do possess genius tend to be an- androgyne. Uh, I, he's trying to find a, a, a biological basis for this uh, for for this fluid which feeds uh, the the higher genius. We we've looked at this in. Lieber Samach before, talking about the little drop of dew, which would inspire the campaign of the Holy Guardian Angel to sort of take over your whole soul and heart. Mm-hmm. And uh, and there's some spiritual organ, very much like the, the, the male gonad, which produces a fluid very much like semen, uh, uh, which is, is where this little uh, drop of dew comes from. And he's not saying it's impossible for women to have this, but there's some biological reason, he thinks, uh, for this to be more common in in men than in women. Uh, Later on, he'll also talk about cultural reasons, uh, which is is, uh, why um, uh, women tend not to express genius, which I think people will find a little bit more relatable. But it and and I was going to sort of do an apologetic saying like, no, 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 this is the same thing like that uh, Madame Beauvoir says in Second Sex, you know, like women uh, Mm. can't, you know, women don't have projects. They have, you know, the, they aspire to marriage because society just, 
that's all society offers them. But there really is also a biological component for Crowley about the difference between the ways men and women express genius. And he says here why women just tend to have less genius. Yeah, I mean, this is like uh, allusion to the solar phallic nature of Thelema, essentially. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think you can avoid the basic idea that that's um, one of the core aspects of Thelema, uh, you can certainly dance around it and, uh, and that sort of thing. But uh, um, I don't know. It's, yeah. it's there. But I mean, uh, there are women. Uh, Crowley initiates women into the OTO. Crowley mm-hmm. initiates women into the AA. Uh, there are um, uh, women who attain not, uh, K and C. Uh, um, Crowley thinks of uh, the the Scarlet Women with whom he takes up as being, you know, his initiators. You know, if he doesn't have someone of a superior degree to sort of train him up to the next level, then he will learn from a sexual partner to train himself up to the next level. So um, whatever this biological component is, it doesn't become a bar to initiation, except Crowley says in Blue Lodge Masonry, where he says women are just biologically incapable of performing the secret of the third degree, whatever that is. <laughs> um, but uh, um, uh, but I, I think, you know, uh, women have organs analogous to the gonads, <laughs> and they can produce uh, spirit, they can possibly produce spiritual fluid analogous to uh, um, whatever this spiritual fluid is so uh we don't have to worry about this too too much but this is the the premise here that the um that the genius is going to be fed by this sort of spiritual sexual fluid so closely is this secretion connected with the sexual economy that appears to me at times as if it might be a byproduct of the process which generates semen that some form of this doctrine has generally been accepted is shown in the prohibitions of all religions. Sanctity has been assumed to depend on chastity, and chastity has nearly always been interpreted as abstinence. But I doubt whether the relation is so simple as this would imply. And so we're trying to build this uh, this relationship by tradition, right? So um, uh, it's it's not... Crowley's saying this is not my in- innovation. You know, there's a there's a there's a there's a long, long tradition of seeing magical force as being somehow tied up with um, uh, with the the generation, the preservation, the retention of of sexual fluid. Um, and my innovation is simply going to be that it's not pure retention that it's required. It's some relationship between uh, mm. retention and expression. Uh, and that we uh, and that it's the it's the production of of seminal fluid that creates this uh, this other type of fluid that that feeds genius. So so it needs more research required. We need to we need to study this yeah. uh, sort of process. Um, sort of understanding the idea of how to properly uh, define and apply chastity mm-hmm. in a functional way because yeah it again goes back to the idea that you have a certain zeitgeist that or you have somebody who starts the idea uh in this case the idea of um chastity or something along those lines and then it goes out into the world and bounces around and 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 uh, with people saying you can never have sex for your entire life and that sort of thing. We, I wonder if this is why women's mysteries also end up being sort of tied to uh, menstruation and 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 this this the sort of uh, life cycles there. Like that, that that there's this, you know, maybe during the follicular phase is when they express their creativity in the mm. in, in this the same way that it says uh, um, men express creativity by the by the production of semen. That the that the the generation of this kind of uh, um, the analogous sex cells in, in yeah. In this women is the thing. Is the, is, I'm, I'm is a little loath. Element. I'm a little loath to dismiss too quickly the idea that there's uh, this uh, phallocentric kind of core to this theory, even though it's not like he's implying it heavily. I guess he's saying mm-hmm. it outright without saying it outright in a sense. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's mm-hmm. like saying it as clearly as he can without without getting banned, I guess, <laughs> being able to put the books out still. But it does seem important, and it does seem like this is his theory. It's yeah. the core of his theory. So uh, it's kind of like we have to have that 
uh, clarity on what the theory is so that we can see that uh, the way that he builds up the um, elements of the experiment to test the theory being the uh, the ritual that he's describing, that sort of thing. And uh, even there, like there's going to be implications heavy in this mm-hmm. because, again, he's not able to just say too clearly uh, to some extent. He's speaking pretty clearly, I mean. But yeah, that getting a, getting a hold of that – you know, that initial theory, it does seem like that's at the core of it. And I certainly wouldn't say that there's any, I don't think there's any difference between men and women, except for the fact that they're uh, like any given person is dealing with all the elements of their, their, their body, their growth, their, their experience and all those things come into play and that sort of thing. But as far as like, I like, obviously that doesn't affect you know, somebody's ability to progress and that sort of thing. So what he seems to be talking about here is the theory that um, genius, as he's calling it, which Mm -hmm. seems to be essentially channeling divinity, this is one one way we could put it, is somehow caught up with uh, sexuality. Yeah. He says the production of semen, um, I have a hard time completely understanding the correlation there perfectly but i'm no ninth degree or anything like that (laughs) so but that's like i say that's kind of his theory that he's building this off of and i think it would be uh it's kind of important to keep that some in the back of our heads even if we whether or not we want to agree with it totally or understand it oh i concur i guess uh i had a recent experience going to uh the chiropractic college to, to look at all these cadavers, get some, uh, to develop, develop my uh, anatomical knowledge. So they just had all these um, people just lying on tables and you could uh, wear gloves and put your hands in them. I got to hold a human heart and a human brain and, uh, you know, see the way the nerves move through the thigh or whatever else. And uh, there's the anatomical laboratory and adjacent to that was a small museum, just one room. And I saw the... Um, women in the class uh, gathered around a wet specimen like of a, of a uterus, the whole female sex thing. And they were like, they were all, they were like, Ooh, like everyone was like, what's that? And they were like, Oh, it's a, this. And they were like, like, they were like, Ooh, you know, <laughs> I'm like, Oh, there it is. <laughs> they were just like, uh, it was uh, without realizing it, they had assumed an attitude of worship. Like reverence. And man. I thought that if I had seen someone's, dick and balls <laughs> just like, like there's no way like in the world that i would uh that i that i would be struck in that way and well they are on the outside of the body so it's a little more accessible i guess but the way the way in which women have this kind of ongoing and profound relationship with their their yeah. sex organs because they're always you know either in pain or in pleasure or in 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 some sort of complication and there's the it, it really sort of struck me the way the way they were able to to see that to see you know a mummified uterus and be like whoa yeah and yeah. like and and have this attitude and i thought and so this this paper on the the you know using mechanical means to generate genius it's obvious that that would be associated with semen production because we sort of have to use mechanical means to <laughs> um, to to sort of express that. But the, in in women, that sort of expression is foisted upon them whether they want it or whether they want it or not, and the the cycle just happens mm-hmm. however it happens. And I I, I only mention it because I thought that was an interesting difference. Mm-hmm. That is a fascinating. Uh aspect of things as well like the the female uh just to observe it because of the fact that uh, like i mean for instance we'll have equinox and solstice Mm -hmm. uh rituals with the uh, toronto philema we have uh the god forms of uh from resh which are kephra tomb hathor and uh ra and uh, we always open it up and, uh, you know, the, there is always that sort of sense of like, well, we don't want to assign gender roles or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So we'll allow people to be whatever role they want to be and not try to hoist something on somebody. But without fail, the, the women always want to be Hathor. Right. <laughs> so there is that, that reverence for female divinity and just female hood. Um, is there anything else you wanted to look at in these first three sections because to um to me it's it's it just seems like a list of different 
experiments and different results, and it's all very, very diasporate. But if you had seen um, something else that was worth re- worth quoting, I would, I would, I would like to know that. Yeah, I think in um, part three. It's just sort of like referencing the fact that you, the this massive store of energy mm-hmm. that's available. He's, uh, I mean, he he prefers to extend. He says, "Extend my connotation of man rather than to invent God," which is one of those questionable kind of. Well, not questionable, but it's one of those questions of whether you want to see this force as coming from outside yourself or coming from within yourself but just finding that your within yourself is bigger than you understand currently mm-hmm. yeah no i think that's uh, uh Cro- crowley's always always doing things by convenience you know and there is an attempt in h- here somewhere to try to build some sort of an ontology and I find it totally inscrutable, and maybe this is uh, where it is. But um, but yeah, there's there, he's like he, he sort of he sort of thinks it's like okay, it's like an it's like an ontology of a metaphysics of genius, and it doesn't seem related to his other mm-hmm. his other metaphysics. And I I can't I can't work out what he's saying. But <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's in and the reason he says he prefers not to call it God is that other people are calling it God, right? I mean, we know. Uh, and he's he's F- F- Thelema when he's writing papers for beginners, and this is not uh, a ninth degree OTO paper. This is something for public consumption. Uh, he always tries to just deal with the facts of the case at hand without making any big yeah. guesses, any big leaps into the Occam's into razor. the mysteries. It's like, yeah, okay, so no, no, you're going to do these practices, and then you're going to be able to express genius, but don't. Uh, don't worry about whether it's God or not. Just, yeah. you know, maybe it's your subconscious mind or something spooky like that. Um, yeah, and, I guess the, uh, the facility of that is the fact that it's like uh, what he's trying, what he's always trying to do is is to demonstrate or discover that this idea is, it's like a reproducible occurrence. So it's like uh, in the same way as any phenomenological fact that we would scientifically analyze. So rather than it being something reliant on some outside being, we ought to be able to recreate it within ourselves. And that's kind of one of the uh, theories going on in this. Well, you, you wanted to um, keep coming back to the idea of, of madness as a, as a you mm. know, just a, as a gentle thread. And all that stuff you sent me last week uh, from Martin T. Starr and the Thelemites about... Uh, uh, w. T. Smith uh, and w. The w. Thelemites. W. T. Smith and the Thelemites. Yep. Uh, is it by Martin P. Starr? Yes. Is that why I'm getting yes. mixed up? <laughs> uh, all that stuff you sent me about, about just uh, Achad having, like someone else's diaries about the diaries of a cop yeah. that we read and how he really seemed to be having a complete psychotic episode. Yeah. And Crowley communicating only with a cop by correspondence didn't grab this right away, like didn't notice. And there's that telling thing in a cop's diary where he says like, uh, uh, sold all my possessions and went to meet the great beast in New York. For some reason, he didn't seem happy to see me. <laughs> 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 and like, uh, and, and I think, I think Crowley probably encountered this several, times in his life where he was teaching someone uh, mysteries and everything seemed to be going fine and then that person had a complete psychotic break mm-hmm. and uh, um, and he he sort of complains about his like if I have any magical power it's the power to cause crisis <laughs> uh, and uh, you know even his gardener at Beleskin who supposedly committed suicide or something mm. like this um, that uh, that maybe part of the reason he gets so focused on rationality and trans rationalism and like, you know, making sure people understand logic principles and don't make too big leaps and like stay skeptical, at least in the beginning stages is that he's seen way too many times one person make, you know, have one profound insight and go completely off the rails in a way that is sort of indescribable unless you've, I can't say it any other way. Like, unless you've had family members with schizophrenia, Mm -hmm. you don't know what this picture actually looks like. And it's just obviously immediately like, oh, that's not great. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So. Yeah. And that's actually touched on in this uh, little section as well. Just the briefly the fact that this genius can, when it's ordered, 
it manifests as genius. Oh, that's true. Let's let's read that since I went on that huge tangent. Exactly parallel, nowhere meeting is the case of mania. Nowhere meeting. Exactly parallel, but nowhere meeting. Mm -hmm. A madman may struggle against six trained athletes for hours, showing no sign of fatigue. Then he will suddenly collapse. But at a second's notice from the irritable idea will resume the struggle of fresh as ever. Until we discovered unconscious muscular action and its effects, it was rational to suppose that such a man was possessed of a devil. And the difference between the madman and the genius is not in quantity, but in the quality of their work. Genius is organized, madness, chaotic. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's, uh, but the, the way the spirit kind of moves through a mad person is analogous to the way we hope genius will move through uh, mm -hmm. a healthy person, a robust person, creating actions. He says unconscious muscular action, which I think is not exactly right, but creating activity uh, removed from ordinary conscious monitoring you know yeah. you behave without you, you write without thinking you behave without, mo without yeah i'm struggling to write a, a bit for the newsletter that's uh on the rational mind and that sort of thing and and kind of uh this is pertinent to that just because it's yeah it seems like well the rational mind is there and when you have this force coming through, it uh, can be very uh, explosive. It can be very uh, throw things out of whack and that sort of thing. So if you don't have an ordered rational mind, even if you do, this can be very, you know, I mean, in the case of Ahad, I think he had a very ordered rational mind. Mm -hmm. But like, uh, yeah, you it can very easily reassemble itself taking that explosion that just came thundering through and uh, reassessing reality based on that to include that. But then it very quickly falls back into a, a sort of mechanistic uh, operation. And if it's, yeah, if it's not elastic enough to realize, okay, well, sure, there was this thundering energy that came through, but... You know, if you if you if you take things too seriously with this newfound perspective on on the world, you might not be you know set up in such a way that you can go back to your regular scheduled program. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we have our twin premises here now. Uh, genius is fed by a fluid, a spiritual fluid, which is analogous to semen and a byproduct of the a premise that creates semen. And so if you want uh, to be have, have greater and greater access to your own genius to be able to do creative work, um, then you need to start studying this relationship. And Crowley finds it inscrutable. He says... To sum up, I can always trace a connection between my sexual condition and the condition of artistic creation, which is so close as to approach identity, yet so loose that I cannot predict a single important proposition. And so now in chapter four, he's going to start trying to predict important propositions. And he says that he's going to he's going to do this with reference to tradition. He's going to do this academically because he's failed to do it scientifically. He says the Greeks say there are three methods of discharging the leaden jar of genius. These three methods they assign to gods: Dionysus, Apollo, Aphrodite. In English, wine, women, and song. Or sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I was, I'm glad you did because I wasn't going <laughs> to. I think last season, uh, I was complaining a little bit that people didn't uh, know what spiritual work was, you know, that, that it seemed like sometimes people just thought like going to the gym was something they were doing for their spirit or, uh, um, you know, work-life balance or something that this was, that this find, trying to find your work-life balance was like a spiritual pursuit. And then uh, last season we found again and again and again about self-annihilation, self-annihilation, that mm. like even magic is about self-annihilation in, in, its, in its highest attainments. Uh, and so something we should say before we get too far into it, he says an hour and a quarter into it, <laughs> um, is that this paper gives you a clue about what magic is for um, mm -hmm. in the Thelemic conception because Crowley talks very very little about the kind of grimoire magic that gets you 
money houses and rare philosophy books uh, or like hot dates and whatever That's else. True, yeah. um, but this is a paper explicitly about prophecy. And we know Crowley can kind of do prophecy, right? He's he's got all of the the, mm -hmm. the class A writings and stuff, uh, channeled works of poetry or whatever. Uh, in here, sometime later, he'll say that um, he'll say that the Greeks called this prophecy, and it's not the kind of prophecy where you can predict future events in minute detail, like Old Testament prophecy. But it's it's like having access to inspired spiritual truths that allow you to create, you know, great works of art mm -hmm. sort of spontaneously. And he has a lot of, he talks about, uh, there's a, a great pianist he talks about in here, uh, who was, I think the Czech prime minister and one of the people who signed the, can't remember what it's called, uh, but uh, but uh, basically a peace treaty after one of the world wars. Gotcha. And I was just on the verge of saying nice research, and then <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and some painters and stuff, and so and he's he's making reference to all these people to kind of inspire you about the kinds of things that you can do with this work once you have the the sort of spiritual channel open. So um, it's not just about self destruction; it's about you know, inspired generation. So we uh, we were talking about these three gods are Dionysus, Apollo, Aphrodite, in English, wine, women, and song, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, and then he's going to apologize for that for like a page and a half. <laughs> he's going to say, I don't, I don't, I don't mean like sailors, taverns, and brothels, you know, even though, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll happen in sailors, taverns, and brothels. Although that does give us uh, something to balance what we are saying against mm -hmm. because, yeah, there's the, uh, again, the carnal sort of sense in which we can consider these things versus the more religiously ecstatic and divine sense. Mm -hmm. So it's not just license. It's not just an excuse for... Uh, for this kind of carnality, but uh, it's seeing that we can we can use these things as being analogous to the highest exaltation of of divinity. The that's right. Uh, it would be a great mistake to imagine that the Greeks were recommending a visit to the brothel, as well condemn the high mass at St. Peter's on the strength of having witnessed a Protestant revival meeting. So he's saying a Protestant revival meeting is a brothel, <laughs> and the kind of sex he wants to have is analogous to a high mass at St. Peter's. Um, uh, a, a rare Catholic sentiment coming <laughs> from, from Crowley there. Um, but what he means is Protestant revivals are sort of, uh, you know, wild community events where people get together and, you know, faith healing is accomplished and music is played. And, uh, and, and the high mass at St. Peter's has an extremely high degree of formalism. And uh, it's a bit weird because what he's saying he wants, the goal is to have spontaneous generation, you know, to be able to do artwork naturally and directly inspired by the spirit, which is what the Protestant revivals say that they're able to do it there, you know, simple well, I feel like, revival uh, meetings. But the, but the, the sex act itself, uh, in order to contact the spirit, needs to have this kind of high degree of formalism around it. Yeah, I mean, I will say that uh, I think he's having been having grown up in Protestant England, where uh, and especially with the Plymouth Brethren, which were even the Protestants weren't Protestant enough for them. <laughs> <laughs> There's this, uh, you know, destruction of all the things associated with Catholicism in the sense of like uh, symbols, uh, statues, um, all the magic ritual that was in the Catholic Mass. I think uh, I get the sense. Crowley is constantly sort of uh, appreciating that aspect of Catholicism that still does magic ritual. And that's what he's probably seeing is in this high mass is this real exaltation of the highest magic ritual that um, has potentiality there. He still thinks it's, you know, corrupted. It's still um, spoilt and, and stained by by all the problems that come with, with the... Uh, 
the Catholic Church and all of its politics and all that sort of thing. And he sees – he describes the Protestant movement as having been – uh, rebellion against that that might have gone the right direction, but ended up creating something even worse, mm-hmm. which was a sterility. So uh, the sense I get when he, whenever he's referring to Protestantism, I feel like it's him having grown up in this extremely hoity-toity, uptight kind of uh, environment where um, there's a repression and a shame. Like you don't you don't talk about we don't discuss the SQ, the sex question. We we put it in in initials. Is because, that what SQ stands for? Yeah. It's in here a couple of times, I think, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, so that helps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never, I didn't know what that stands for. Because you for. don't say it or spell it out in full in, in polite company. What's the question? Uh, just the subject, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, are you having it? <laughs> Uh, 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 does Plymouth Brethren host revival meetings? I no. feel like they're allergic to fun. No, I, that's what, a, that's what my fun. point is. Yeah, yeah, like I think like what kinds of revival meetings you might be thinking of are more in the States, mm-hmm. um, which is sort of, again, sort of almost seems like pining for some of the, the celebratory aspects of what religion is supposed to have an element of. But uh, I think in, in Protestant England, I don't think you see so much. I mean, I could be wrong. Maybe I'm uh, totally misunderstanding. But like I say, I think from Crowley's perspective, he's seeing it as a, the Protestantism as an extremely repressive force. Which I, I don't think that uh, that's a, a problem. I just... Uh, when he said revival meeting, I did, you're right. I imagined sort of a very American f- phenomenon, and uh, mm-hmm. and I, you know, there's Plymouth Brethren in uh, in in Canada today too. Oh, yeah. and I don't know if they well the they yeah the, the people who landed at thing. Plymouth Rock, <laughs> they were uh, you know it was the uh, it was the whole idea of uh, Protestantism. Toronto is a Protestant, a heavily Protestant mm-hmm. city, but. Uh, uh, it's, you know, the, it, that's who a big portion of the people coming in from England were, the Protestants. That's what we inherited from them. So Now, sex is justly hollowed in this sense that it is the eternal fire of the race. The sexual act being a sacrament, it remains to consider in what respect this limits the employment of the organs. First, it is obviously legitimate to employ them for their natural physical purpose, but it may be allowable to use them ceremonially for a religious purpose. We shall find the act hedged about with many restrictions. For in this case, the organ becomes holy. It matters little to mere propagation that men should be vicious. The most debauched rogue might, and almost certainly would, beget more healthy children than a semi-sexed prude. So the so-called moral restraints are not based on reason. They are thus neglected. But admit its religious function, and one may at once lay down that the act must not be performed. It must not be undertaken lightly and foolishly without excuse." Uh, so, and this is something I didn't notice before, um, but I read Jerry Cornelius's l- latest book on sex magic mm-hmm. when he, he talks about, you know, if, if you're going to dedicate yourself to these sorts of practices and a- allow sex to become a holy thing, then doing sex sometimes in ritual but then sometimes just for fun, casually, you know, blasphemously. At least his perspective was that, Crowley's perspective was that it didn't work and that a lot of uh, Crowley's secret, not secret teachings, but oral teachings around sex magic were about really, really maintaining the sex act as a, a sexual kind of temple isolate and that you couldn't just Mm -hmm. you once you started doing sex magic sex for fun was almost off the table you needed to discipline and dedicate yourself with regular practice to the kind of detachment that kant is talking about when looking at an artistic nude Mm -hmm. Um, that's very contrary to what everybody who talks about crowley tends to say as well um uh, but uh, and i don't know I can't evaluate Cornelius's claims at all, except that when I read these three paragraphs, I, it, it's, it seems to be saying some of the same things, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, certainly what Crowley said was more in, in line with that. So there's all kinds of stories about people 
having known him in real life or met him, uh, I think a lot of them are apocryphal, but, uh, and some of them are just, uh, the types of things where you get, th- you know, you're one of those uh, uptight Protestants maybe, and <laughs> you end up like being very scandalized by just the very, uh, openness to talk about sex or something like that. So here's what I was saying earlier about, uh, the appropriate use of magical force and, mm. uh, and where, where spiritual, practice kind of comes into play in life. He says, uh, we may once lay down that the act must not be profaned. It may be undertaken for the direct object of the continuation of the race. I have a little numero one next to that paragraph. And two, it may be undertaken in obeyance to real passion. For passion, as the name implies, is rather inspired by a force of divine strength and beauty without the will of the individual and often against it. Um, I'm, I'm the casual or habitual, which the Christians call idle use or rather abuse of these forces is what constitutes their profanation. All personal considerations must be banished utterly. This is, uh, we banish utterly the personal considerations, but respond to passions. Yeah. The fact that all personal considerations must be banished utterly that seems like uh, that's directly what I was thinking of earlier when I was saying that this is like contrary to what most people think of when they think of Crowley's attitudes about sex. I think people use it as an example of uh, – or an excuse to do the hippie thing. It's like right. let's all live in a commune and, and be uh, the Californian Thelemites in Agape Lodge and, and uh, we can have sex with each other and, and all that sort of thing. And, and Crowley was critical of them. Crowley was not happy with them and uh, the way that they were living in that sense and the fact that like stuff like W.T. Smith, he was the head of the lodge and he he got really excited about the fact that, oh, because I am this priest in the Gnostic mass, now the way that women interact with me, there's this this totally different dynamic than mm-hmm. what was when he didn't have that, you know, it's basically power is you, you get drunk on power. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. That sort of thing. So, and Crowley was very critical of the way that they were doing things. He wouldn't have been critical of that if that was the goal, if that was the, the program. I think he saw a photo of, like a class photo of the Agape Lodge people and wrote back, uh, uh, what kind of people are you initiating over there? It looks like a bunch of sluts and hobos. <laughs> <laughs> he also had a way of words. <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, you know, he, he never, n- he was never uh, uh, unbrigadocious about his poetical <laughs> capacity. Sluts and hobos by Alistair Crowley. <laughs> sluts and hobos. Um, Yeah, all personal considerations must be banished utterly, just as any priest can perform the miracle of transubstantiation. So can any man, possessing the the necessary qualifications, perform this other miracle, whose nature must form the subject of a subsequent discussion. And then, uh, oh, this is kind of fun here, a little further down. Physical strength and beauty are necessary and desirable for aesthetic reasons, the attention of the worshippers being liable to distraction if the celebrants are ugly, deformed, or incompetent. I hardly need emphasize, though, that it is necessary for the strict self-control and concentration on their part, as it would be blasphemy to enjoy the gross taste of wine of the sacrament, so must the celebrant suppress even the minutest manifestation of animal pleasure." Yeah. Again. Yeah. That, uh, you're. You're. You mentioned earlier the wine of the sacrament thing. Yeah. Getting blasted on the Eucharistic <laughs> wine. So with these preliminaries settled, in order to guard against foreseen criticisms of those Protestants who, God having made them a little lower than the angels, have made themselves a great deal lower than the beasts, by their consistently bestial interpretation of all things human and divine. We may consider first the triune nature of these ancient methods of energizing enthusiasm. I just love the fact that the the first the clause the, that's sort of enclosing that is with these preliminaries settled in order to guard against foreseen criticisms and then closing with we may consider first the triune nature of these ancient methods of en- 
energizing enthusiasm. And then there's that massive block of text within that mm-hmm. <laughs> within that clause, breaking it up. That's just a, an assault on <laughs> Protestantism again. <laughs> But it does really hit an important note again. It's the idea of like making this thing bestial, which again goes back to that whole idea that he references in here somewhere of like the idea of the leering looks uh, at the at the uh, at the suggestion of the topic of sex, and the idea of like trying to deal with your discomfort by laughing it off like a school kid, you know? Yeah. Music has two parts. It's not quite true, but. Tone or pitch and rhythm. And I'll speak as a musician. Rhythm is the most important aspect of music. It's, it was amazing to me when I started doing electronic composition. The first thing I did was take samples of other songs that I liked and try to smash them together. And, uh, and not having a great pitch memory. I was never sure whether or not the songs were in the same key or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as long as I were able to place them so that the the rhythm lined up, it didn't matter. Like mm-hmm. forced harmonies are still harmonies. <laughs> uh, the um, it, but it had to be that the yeah. that the beats were happening in the right places. Your, your ear will adjust to the the melody and the harmony. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, this is where you get modulations from and that sort of thing. But uh, the rhythm is the heartbeat. What are the two grossest? Like if he's going to say music has two parts and like Mm -hmm. speak in the most gross possible terms about, you know, I'm, we can then take those two parts and fragment them into other sections. Uh, You don't like saying rhythm and melody being the two parts of music. Well, he calls uh, it tone, tone or pitch tone, yeah. and uh, rhythm. That's not far off. That's pretty much okay. that's pretty much there. I would just say harmony. It's like melody and harmony. I would parse it as, and then other people might argue other things can be, uh, but pretty much it falls under those categories for the most part. So. I, yeah, I would. I, I I guess maybe I'm I'm okay with pitch and rhythm, and then breaking pitch into melody and harmony. Yeah, because um, it's just like the the sound has a note. <laughs> <laughs> or a quality, you know, or a frequency, and then the and then it, it's played in some. Especially for his purposes pacing. here, like we're yeah. not talking about uh, Beethoven symphony or something like that. That no. would actually be contrary to what we want in this case, as he'll get into. Um, the latter quality associates it with the dance, meaning rhythm, mm-hmm. and that part of dancing which is not rhythm is sex. Because, you know, sex is just a chaotic noise of <laughs> lacking rhythm, <Yeah>. I guess. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly that part of rhythm or that part of dancing, which is not rhythm. I guess it's just the uh, the physical, the physicality of it, I suppose. I've always kind of thought this and the way he expresses it, I find kind of beautiful. It's like... There are there are many kinds of art which can express many kinds of things. You know, you can have a, a Bob Dylan protest number, or you can have a pornographic rap song, or you can have uh, music for high mass, or um, and, and you know, books can be about anything. Paintings can be about anything. Paintings you lose the element of time, but you know, whatever. But fashion and dance. The like the only fashion statement is look at how great I look. <laughs> <laughs> like, you can't have a costume about the Third World War, <laughs> uh, and and the only like all dance is just pornography. <laughs> so like I don't understand, like I don't understand how Swan Lake has a story. Like it's just <laughs> good looking people doing insane things. And so the the idea that you know dance is obviously related to music and in that it's an ex- a musical expression it does count as an art form but you, if you take away the music it's just sex and I 100% <laughs> feel that. <laughs> Now, that part of sex, which is not a form of the dance, animal movement, is intoxication of the soul, which connects it with wine. 
Further identities will suggest themselves to the student. He's asking you to work this out, right? Yeah, so, so you can figure out the uh, Aphrodite, Apollo, and and Dionysus connections. Yeah, like maybe tone or pitch, you know, like you're saying melody. Maybe that's languid. Maybe it's liquid. Uh, um, that makes it sexy, but because, but it, it also makes it whiny. And so the music... <laughs> You know, music can be sex via intoxication when you think about rhythm, or it can be intoxication via sex when you talk about melody, and uh, and you know you could come up with the same sort of uh, cabala of wine and the mm-hmm. same sort of cabala of of intercourse. Find the musical elements, as you're saying. You were complaining that he was saying that part of dancing, which is not rhythm, is sex. Well, it's, you know, as if sex isn't rhythmic, but like that's another. You know, that's another way out. It's like, oh, you find the music in sex by realizing the rhythm and melody of it. Mm-hmm. So, And this will start to feel like it's uh, attacking each of the levels of the human organism in order to uh, distract mm-hmm. and align them in a sort of form of trance, I suppose. So, uh, like he goes on to say, by the use of these three methods in one, the whole being of man may thus be stimulated. The music will create a general harmony of the brain, leading it in its own path. The wine affords a general stimulus of the animal nature, and the sex excitement elevates the moral nature of the man by its close analogy with the highest ecstasy. So we're we're taking the mind, the body, and I suppose you would say the soul – uh, and we're we're giving them all things to do. There's we haven't actually said the word in any of these quotations, so we're getting away with it in this podcast. But Crowley's uh, use of language is a little bit idiosyncratic. When he says orgy, he almost never means sex with multiple par- partners. Mm-hmm. Orgy is his word for this kind of thing, mm-hmm. where um, where you become so overwhelmed with the sex act that it becomes spontaneous, you know, that you get into that kind of beautiful flow state and you're just, you're, you know, you're not second guessing yourself or thinking about what to have for dinner or it becomes meditative. You're just fucking. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and his use of the word moral is similarly interesting and, and idiosyncratic. He talks about how practicing rest teaches moral lessons or, or, Mm -hmm. you know, this idea of the moral character being elevated by the elevation of sex or people don't become moral agents until they, uh, hit, puberty and we came up with a a way of reconciling that to the more colloquial use of the word moral but he has some very uh, particular ideas about the word chastity and about the word moral and about the word orgy there there's a there's a sort of crowleyan language around some of these words yeah. and, and i think a lot of it moral's one that i have a hard time mm-hmm. pinning down to a definition, although I think I, I have a feeling of what he means when he says it. Yeah, he's got a, a great love of etymology. Mm-hmm. Um, this might be one of those cases. This is a good excuse to break out Skeet's etymology. Uh, if we've done nothing else today, at least we've broken out Skeet's <laughs> etymology. Good when you're clicking the Skeet's. We're talking etymology. Skeet's etymology is the... Uh, I, I, I know we've... Uh, Mentioned this probably previously at some point when I mentioned the fact that I got this, but it's uh, Crowley's actual um, beloved etymological dictionary that he would go to, so he would always reference it, particularly in uh, Magic Without Tears, I remember it, but I don't know if he uh, referenced it earlier, in earlier years or anything like that. But, uh, so we're looking for moral. 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 Here we go. It's very short uh, entry. Moral moralis from the uh, Latin. Uh, relating to conduct from mos, a manner or custom. So that, not much to deal with there. It seems just like exactly what we think that it means. Yeah, nothing, nothing special. Although a manner or custom is a little bit of a looser conception than what we might associate by our manner and custom of today. Mm-mm. So, because uh, moral, we tend to get very uh, um, 
we we uh, it, I think colloquially we tend to think of it as being you know the differences between right and wrong and that sort of thing but to give it just to reduce it to manner and custom is a little bit bereft of huh, moral judgments uh values we we talk about values morals and ethics and uh values are values are are things that we prefer uh, morals are our instincts about what is right and wrong, and ethics are written codes that society sort of holds. So, um, so the 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 ethics are hopefully reflections of our morals and values, but are don't necessarily have to be because they're they're standardized for everyone. Where morals and values can be personal, mm-hmm. so to. Uh, refine and excite the moral nature, uh, especially in terms of like, speaking of it in terms of custom is just fine because a group of people can have, you know, similar moral ideas. It kind of uh, seems to flatten it, though. Mm-hmm. It makes it less interesting than I want it to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he has this he, he has this very uh, strange idea that's that's connected with spiritual elevation. You know, it's like the moral nature is uh, the idea of right and wrong, th- how we think about it colloquially, our, our instincts for that. Um, uh, he thinks that, that the refining and... Exa- and and development of those uh, um, has to do with with some deep so deeply somehow with with spiritual progress and that there's not a perfect way to be but a but but that the he thinks of the moral nature as being almost like a self like self expression you know like your your correct attitude to everything else is your perfect you know your moral yeah maybe that connects it back to what i was saying earlier about the idea that uh somebody like keith 418 Mm -hmm. might have a a clear uh description of what he's getting at when he's describing or or stating something uh but then it bounces around and i perceive that other people try to parrot the same idea Mm -hmm. and it becomes necessarily degraded did i get that word right Degraded. Degraded. Degradated. More degraded, fun. yeah. <laughs> it gets necessarily degraded. Uh, and maybe this is an example of like, well, it's sort of like you're elevating yourself towards that state of mind that's able to to parse the thing in the first place rather than simply taking information and, and rehashing it. Now we're, now we're going to sort of move into this idea of going to a ball. Um, and I think this is important because the story about the ball en- encompasses more than one section. And so if you just drop into like section eight, you might not understand what he means by now the purpose of such a ball. So mm, there is a little story true. about going to this ball. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he does mention also the fact that uh, because he's leaving off with um, – it remains, however, always for him to make the final transmutation. Unless we have the special secretion, which I have postulated, the result will be commonplace. So the result of our wine, women, and song uh, will be commonplace and no better than the tavern, uh, the you know the sea shanty or what have you, than if, if we don't also have that secretion that he's positing. There, it's the something missing, right? Like we can become, we can take a screenwriting class and learn about the a, a three act structure, and uh, and we can have a cool idea about a cool samurai <laughs> or something, um, um, and then and and we can we can organize all our beats nicely onto our outline, uh, but then when we start writing, we either get inspired or not Mm -hmm. and we can use any technique in the world to to try to tap into that deep inspiration but sometimes it's available and sometimes it's not Mm -hmm. and uh the idea of this of this paper is to use magical techniques to 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 figure out what's missing and for for crowley the uh this Flu- the spiritual fluid analogous to semen is the is the something that's sometimes missing and uh and we're we're developing the way to to proceed so that's helping us to realize that this is not simply a matter of creating the trance itself yeah. the trance itself is uh, part of the mechanism to 
to achieve the goal. I am surprised to learn uh, that there is no semen anywhere in Hollywood. No, not they don't a, have any ports? No. no the, <laughs> <laughs> well done. No, they, there's, there hasn't been a single inspired piece of film that came out of that. <laughs> came out of that. <laughs> it's come out of Hollywood in 40 years. <laughs> not, nobody, no, nobody in Hollywood has any semen available. Well, you see what they did to poor David Lynch when he tried to... Tried to semenize over everything? <laughs> well, there's plenty of semen, but they're not lining it up with their uh, magical practice. I guess so. <laughs> the delivery system is not correct. He also says these if these society rights such as these balls, are properly performed, there should be no exhaustion. After a ball, one should feel the need for a long walk in the young morning air. The weariness or boredom, the headache or somnolence are nature's warnings. I feel like this is the the kind of statement you make when you're still uh, roughly 36 or 37, which he was at the time. As you become a middle-aged man, it becomes less <laughs> less uh, desirable to have to be walking around in the morning air. <laughs> well, he deals with uh, he deals with uh, aging uh, mm. very soon. Now, and so he's he's got a couple of different operations he's going to start describing here. There's the ones we talked about earlier, where he's going to talk about having a candle flame and a group of congregants swaying back and forth gently, uh, listening to a mantra, and the intensity of this experience gradually escalates until everyone sort of has a spontaneous spiritual orgasm. You know, mm-hmm. they don't ejaculate, but the, the necessarily, but uh, they could, I suppose, but the, the ritual comes to a natural sort of climax. And he says, this is very inspiring for the beginner because it gives them a glimpse of the kind of like, yeah. Uh, and then also there's the, uh, the more, in, the more formalized ritual that he'll in the Lovecraft story that, that ends. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is something that you can sort of do by yourself in sort of mundane circumstances where you sort of go out into the world to have very tactile, sensual experiences, you know, and you you expose yourself to uh, hopefully not uh, literally expose yourself mm-hmm. to wine. <laughs> wine. <laughs> Metaphorically, hopefully not metaphorically, expose yourself <laughs> to uh, to wine, women, and song in public places, and and derive from that the sort of spiritual inspiration. Allow yourself to be swept up by you know whatever's happening in the sailors' tavern or the public ball, which is nice too because it's it, it does sort of remind us that these are sort of uh, natural phenomena. I guess you could say, mm-hmm. basically, by which I mean. Not, uh, I think I, there's that funny thing that happens in our heads sometimes where we feel like no religion has to happen in a church in order to happen at all. And it's like, well, if you're, if these spiritual kind of ideas actually have any root in reality, then they can take place potentially anywhere in reality. Have you seen this movie that is called Babylon? I think Margaret Robbie and some guy. Sounds pretty familiar, but I haven't seen it. Certainly. The, one of our heroes is like a butler at some party. And uh, there's a, the, the first hour of the film is this party getting totally out of control. And the the butler and this other attendant kind of fall in love as the party disintegrates around them. And then they don't see each other again for like 10 years. But it, but that, but the disintegration of this party is the, is the sort of springboard Mm. that gives them both their glamorous Hollywood careers. And, uh, and, and it's, and it's just this kind of thing. It's like, you know, you all, you all go, with a, a a considered idea about having a particular kind of experience, and then at some point, it there's the the celebration hits a critical mass, and you just lose control. Mm-hmm. And you know everyone's mingling and drinking and having a good time, and there's nice conversation, and uh, and you know it either becomes a bacchanal or it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the idea is that it, it's up to you. It's not the. It's not the. It's you don't rely on the party to do the party thing. Mm-hmm. You you have to show up with the correct attitude, ready to participate in that kind of a thing, and then go home with the. Go home with the uh, with the inspiration or not? Yeah, know? I guess there's that the the inspiration or the spiritual experience, the sort of uh, 
um, this sort of explosion that can happen. He's talking about it in this Bacchanal kind of scenario, uh, in these in a ball or or in a, in a designed ritual kind of experience and that sort of thing. But he also does reference, for instance. Um, uh, what was his name? Brother Lawrence. He mm-hmm. says in quotes, uh, "Who's a who's a monk uh, in the 1600s? Who uh, um, I read up a little bit about to find out about, and he was, you know, people would reference him at the time for being a very sturdy kind of person on the outside, but then you get to know him, and he's very uh, a lot of kindness and a lot of this deep spiritual insight and uh, uh, ideas about." union with God and that sort of thing, mm-hmm. closeness with God. Yeah, what what Crowley says about him, that he was in constant communication with the Holy Spirit or something, is uh, is basically the only thing I was able to find. After, mm. after Brother Lawrence died, someone wrote a biography of him saying that he was in constant communication with the Holy <laughs> Spirit. And so he's just this avatar, the exemplar well, of what a, it's like to be in constant communication with I, the Holy Spirit. What I read, there was an interesting anecdote that really stuck out to me that I think is kind of a, a quieter, in a way, version of this kind of uh, insight. Or experience uh, where he – because his big moment when he got uh, taken with the idea of this closeness to God was he was involved – he was a soldier in the Thirty Years' War Mm -hmm. in the the middle of the uh, uh, 1600s. And he – on a battlefield, there's a raging battle going on, clearly obviously people being hacked to bits and all that sort of thing. And in the middle of it, there is this barren tree, there are a bare tree that's just standing in the middle of the field. And it occurred to him that in a few months when the spring came, that tree would be blooming. And in the midst of that whole battlefield and everything that was going on, uh, that suddenly gave him an insight into god's presence and uh, that was a that was a tipping point for him and that kind of experience you know it's like that's that comes to mind as being kind of profound uh that's lovely let's uh let's finish where we started with uh with eugenics (laughs) now i am certainly of the opinion that genius can be acquired or in the alternative, that it is almost a universal possession. Its rarity may be attributed to the crushing influence of a corrupt society. And it, it, he speaks more specifically about women later on, but this is the, the counterpoint to the, you know, women are uncreative because of something biological. He says, now, genius either can be acquired or it's almost a universal possession. He says, it's rare to meet a, a youth without high ideals, generous thoughts, a sense of holiness of his own important, which being interpreted is of his own identity with God. Uh, but every serious or spiritual thought is made a jest. Poets are thought soft and cowardly, apparently because they are the only boys with a will of their own and a courage to hold out against the whole school. Boys and masters are in league as once were Pilate and Herod. Honor is replaced by expediency, holiness by hypocrisy. And so we, li- we live in a culture that... that, that crushes poetic instinct <laughs> uh, and sex instinct and so this idea of 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 cultivating uh genius by uh restoring uh the rights of bacchus aphrodite and apollo which to crowley um look suspiciously like first a eugenics program and then a, then a, a sort of initiatory program uh he also says that uh, such a picture is not likely to be painted, we can only then work patiently and in secret. We must select suitable material and train it in utmost reverence to these three methods, or aiding the soul in general orgasm. So, you know, there's, 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 there's more that we could say, but I, I feel that that sort of sort of covers the general attitude of the paper. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you think? Any, any more you want to hit before we do final thoughts? Well, as far as the paper goes, uh, my main thing that's coming to mind is that overall, he's got this, uh, he's got his theories. Mm-hmm. He's got his ideas about the particular act that'll be effective and the way to cultivate that act. And uh, the the... 
he ends up going on like after this point to uh, become a high up member in the OTO and uh, to practice uh, the secrets of the OTO, the ninth degree secret of the OTO and whatnot, which seems to be related directly to this. Um, he goes on to practice this and keep records and that sort of thing. I think we've both read his uh, diaries from the States and into Chefalu where he's he's doing these practices. Uh, so my question is, um, if this is kind of the theory he's working from, he's kind of giving us some idea of what his theory of this, the nature of this thing is. It does seem to be a phallocentric theory. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's talking about his potential eugenics program (laughs) and the ideas that he has in terms of how to make the most out of it. He's always got that kind of idea going on. It's not uncommon. I mean, we still do that today. Like, well, if we, you know, the way society should be is everybody should be able to do X. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like this is communism super popular these days with the kids for some reason. And uh, they're all, you know, arguing for for that in kind of the same way, you know? Right. But, uh, I mean, if we look at, uh, how Crowley went on, went about things like, do you feel like he, uh, actually was getting results from this? Do you, do you see indications of that? Cause reading his diaries, I have a hard time getting clear with myself. I'd have to revisit them, I suppose, cause it's been a while, but getting clear with myself as far as what kind of results he was getting. So the the claim of this paper is that um, that something about his his sexual force is is what allows him to be so consistently creative, mm-hmm. and that he you know he wrote Tanasar very very quickly. Uh, I mean, you would almost have to because you just saw the opera one time and needed to crib the story. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so you know, while you remembered all the beats, you would want to put it down furiously. He says in 16 days or something without sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, and then talks about other times when he was very prolifically poetic. Um, and his early poetry is good. Uh, he gets, um, uh, he ends up uh, wandering into spiritual territory too often kind of and give trying to give magical instruction in the middle of what should otherwise be you know a a, a purely aesthetic experience but um but i I think in term i think as as a master of of verse he's uh he's as good in his early writings as as sort of anyone in terms of you know knowing how meter works and knowing how rhyme scheme works and and being incredibly prolific yeah you know like the amount that he was writing is uh pretty amazing when you consider you know uh, most of us, when we try to be productive and creative and that sort of thing, it's kind of pulling teeth sometimes. But if this is his main boast, that he's able to use sexual energy to attain creative inspiration and that that, that results in mad productivity where he can just write endlessly without eating and sleeping and, you know, the main sex magic diaries that I've read are from the Kefalu period and he talks about being high on cocaine the whole time yeah. and how and the i think they're useful in terms of like the theory of addiction even because he writes about like trying to get off of cocaine and how he feels about it from day to day mm-hmm. um and so um and so i think it's it it becomes really like he you know he's like oh I, you know in the hand of the king to try to get money and then check for $20 came later that week or, you know, to try to attain uh, spiritual fortitude so that I can, you know, go through with this ritual on the weekend or, you know, to get inspiration. The cocaine is already doing everything mm-hmm. that that uh, um, that he thought the sex magic was supposed to do, at least according to this paper. Yeah. And uh, and when and he complains about it because af- if he takes cocaine for three days and just stays awake, then he crashes. He has you know he suffers from cocaine psychosis, does all sorts of things he regrets, and then has to fall asleep. You know, madness. Uh, it, you know, it's 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 just uh, the the whole Kefalu experience is a little bit crazy making, probably partly because of the cocaine. So so his sex magic diaries are not. Um, it's not easy to evaluate the results because mm-hmm. if 
if in reference to this paper, because yeah. what we what we th- what we think they should be doing, he's 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 not controlling his variables very well. Yeah, and we would need a few different uh, control groups and whatnot to be able to gauge from, because yeah, cocaine's a cocaine's a hell of a drug. It's one of those things where yeah, that's if it wasn't cocaine, it might be a little easier to gauge because uh, I mean, if we're talking about wine, woman, and song as being elements of this mm-hmm. thing, then it's uh, well, you can't write it off, uh, even though it is contributing to it but of all things cocaine is one of those things that people are it's notorious for keeping people constantly on go and that that's sort of an thing. excellent point the um because his he includes his drug experience in his sort of tantric explorations and the kefalu period is no less prolific Mm-hmm. You know, uh, everything we read during the first season of the show ended up being written during the Kefalu period. The, our first ideas about what we want to talk about, well, we should definitely hit this, we should definitely hit this, we should definitely hit this. It was all written during the sex magic cocaine experiment <laughs> that was, <laughs> that, that was the, the commune at Kefalu, the Abbey of the at Kefalu. So yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think we have to say it was successful. Yeah, I guess in that case, and uh, at least according to the to the grounds here. Yeah, I I would say that that's the only the only with the caveat that it's uh, you can't just rely on that because you could just as easily say, well, it was just the cocaine. Mm-hmm. Um, but if we had some other control, but lots of people write high on cocaine. Yeah, and they don't have any semen. Uh, see every Hollywood movie for the last 40 yeah. years. It's all just cocaine. Yeah, but I mean, as, as far as a scientific study of this fi- this particular phenomenon goes, um, can we say, for instance, that uh, somebody like Frater Ahad was um, demonstrating results of his own or somebody else that's operating on the same, on the same program, so to speak? Uh, people often lament that like spiritual orders disintegrate after the passing of their founder, you know, Mm. like, um, uh, uh, there's no one to take over for Paul Foster case after case dies. There's no one to take over for Crowley after Crowley dies. I mean, a couple of people try, but the OTO sort of degrades pretty rapidly. And, And, People complain. Uh, one of the one of the things it's it's fashionable to complain about in in sort of cultic circles is this idea of like a charismatic leader, because a ch- charismatic leader is one of the components of like a high control group. Mm. Uh, and so you know, was uh, the BOTA just a cult if they couldn't find another leader after their charismatic leader died? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's a fair question. Like I do think I do think um, Crowley was a cult leader, mm-hmm. <laughs> at least sometimes. Uh, but he was also an incredibly highly realized spiritual being who'd done a significant amount of meditative work. You know, he was maybe the closest thing on earth to a living saint at the time that he was living. <laughs> and I don't know if anyone on earth has matched his attainments since his passing. I mean, we've only had a hundred years or something less than that mm-hmm. uh 80 years to uh, of people trying so um so the fact that that there would be no successor in place i mean imagine if someone were an olympian and then just like founded a school and then nobody who came to their skiing school ever wanted to go skiing <laughs> like then you'd say oh that guy was obviously a cult leader because you know, n- now now the sport of skiing is dead. Only you know he people were only skiing because he was a charismatic leader. It's, you know, mm. it's just the the skills are are hard to develop and difficult to understand, and nobody really gives it the old college try. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so I I think that uh, people like Ahad trying and failing. So the technique might be correct. But his ideas about how to teach the technique, how to perpetuate it, you know, saying that like, oh, we need we need physical tests so that people are physically strong, and then we need rigorous initiations so that the people who come in and study the technique are mentally and spiritually prepared to do it. Um, uh, either those were the wrong ideas, or he didn't put them into practice. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like there was just the uh, or or people. 
pass the tests. You know, they come to the interview, they show up on time for the initiation, they seem to do all the work, and then you were just wrong. Like something goes wrong and they squib out or they quit or they, you know, have some family crisis and it all goes to pot. So, you know, it's uh, uh, the question of whether or not the technique technique works is not the same as whether or not people are able to exploit it. I think the uh, the subject, the idea of getting a grapple on this channeling of genius and uh, coming up with ways of doing it more effectively uh, and using magic as a means of doing that is uh, really, really, it's one of my favorite things about Thelema because I feel like it's it's something that's really worthwhile just for humanity in general. And uh, I think it's it's the type of thing that it's worth us continuing to try and hone in on the most effective ways of doing it. So like if Crowley uh, was living in the zeitgeist where he felt like the sort of eugenics style program made sense to him at that time, um, that's what he had to work with at the time. And uh, there may be elements of that that do become relevant uh, and uh, there may not be. But either way, the getting back to the core idea of energized enthusiasm, of being able to get a better sense of what that genius is that we're talking about and how to channel it more effectively is still a worthwhile program. Also, intuitions are not instincts. Intuitions are trainable. Like you can learn new facts and integrate those. And then the way you respond spontaneously when you know, when the intuition strikes, like, let's say you've spent 40 years training martial arts, and then someone pulls a gun on you, your intuitions for how to respond in that situation, you know, your muscle memory is going to be different than someone who's never trained martial arts, and then someone Mm -hmm. pulls a gun on them. So Crowley is a fairly refined person who's been through a private school system and studied at, you know, for most of an undergraduate degree at Cambridge, and then spent his whole life reading, uh, is going to have a different spontaneous react, you know, if, if, if he gets the spirit in him, Mm-hmm. And just just writes what comes out is going to be much more beautiful than someone like Ahad, who was just an accountant. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, what's his name? The the Godfather of Chaos Magic. Oh, Russell uh, C. F. Russell. C., uh, older. Oh, sorry. Uh, Spare. Austin Spare. Osmond Austin Osmond Spare. Spare. His automatic drawings are much better than my automatic drawings. I can do automatic drawing, but I don't actually know how to draw. Mm. (laughs) So it just, it just, uh, you know, if I close my eyes and my arm moves by itself, which it sometimes does, it's just a bunch of wavy lines. Mm -hmm. But spare, spare's automatic drawings are fucking breathtaking. Mm -hmm. And so um, he says, he says here that the, uh, even in this paper, the most controversial masters in in painting, you know, he has a list of some people who are ma- like Whistler and something like that. He says that they turn out to be using the same rules they were supposedly, you know, overthrowing because the there's just one way to do painting, you know, mm-hmm. or Oh, incidentally, like it just reminded me before I forget to mention it, Commander Marston, he mentions in there somewhere, um, Navy captain and uh, commander, I should say. Uh, he, uh, I happened to try to dig up something on him, but it did make me discover that he was actually involved in the Bartzabell working. He was oh, there really? present with that, yeah. Uh, someone named Marston invented Wonder Woman. <laughs> and then there's a and, lot of Marsons out there. And yeah. the uh, the Wonder Woman person, the Lasso of Truth, comes from the fact that they had discovered um, a technique for uh, tracking systolic blood pressure, Ooh. and uh, which later became his tool for for studying systolic blood pressure. Later, later became part of the uh, lie detector test uh, oh, that really? we know today. Uh, he was a psychologist. He was one of the first people who who noticed a relationship between emotional state and blood pressure and said that, oh, yeah, if this person, you know, we know that blood pressure goes up if you're exercising, but if this person's even just lying to us, their their Mm -hmm. their blood pressure goes up. And I know from reading about Wonder Woman, not reading about this, that that guy was also super into bondage. 
So if he were a psychologist who loved BDSM, who invented Wonder Woman cartoons as like bait material, (laughs) this idea that he maybe did this Tom Tom experiment to induce women to shameless masturbation. It all come uh, together. I think it might be the same guy. Mm. Um, And then uh, here's another thing, uh, which uh, he says, this is... uh, this is Crowley's criticism of the of the work. Listening to Tom Tom music encourages women to shameless masturbation and indecent advances. Crowley says, but this is a natural corollary of the proposition that married English women are usually unacquainted with sexual satisfaction. Their desires are constantly stimulated by brutal and ignorant husbands and never left gratified. This fact accounts for the amazing prevalence of sapphism in London society. <laughs> so, uh, um, again, you know, he, he's, he's noticing that women of his day and age tend to be less prolific artists than the men of his day and age. And he's putting that on, on, uh, on, on, uh, the cultural failing, you know, the, the, the inability to, uh, of incompetent men to sexually satisfy mm. their partners. Is the term sapphism obvious to everyone, by the way? Or oh, is that... I assume so. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, he means... Uh, um, well, Sappho, the, the ancient Greek poetess. He mean, yeah, he means casual poetess. lesbianism, I yeah. assume. <laughs> um, but anyway, that, uh, you know, we didn't uh, do every single word on the page, but I feel like that's, that paper's dealt with pretty yeah, well. Yeah, we did pretty good covering that, I think, so... Good to be back. Good to have things up on the roll and everything. So uh, um, thanks very much for joining me as usual. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, Darren. It was great. 93. 93. Thanks for listening. Look for Toronto Thelema on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Watch for events in the city. And join us again in the darkly splendid abodes. Oh, for the... D is, fi- D is 50, right? 500. Oh. 50 is L. Oh, so... Uh, so, so seven, 709? Close. If you got 500 and then 3... Sees. I'm doing the annoying uh, adult thing. <laughs> I'm like not just telling You've you. You've got I'm like three C's? Giving you a chance to coach your way through I've it. only got two C's. Oh, that's called a misprint. Oh, I, th- I suspect we may encounter a number of Maybe those. misprint if it's not engaged to... Uh, anyway, yeah. so... <laughs> Mrs. Print. <laughs>